on the last part. Trunks' endeavors in the past doesn't end up creating an alternate timeline. Instead, it has a direct effect on his own. Thanks to Trunks' intervention, Goku survives the hard virus. Instead of androids 19 and 20, androids 17 and 18 are the ones to show up because we are following Trunks' timeline. 17 and 18 are defeated, and then we proceed onwards into the Buu saga where Gohan defeats the Bura, so Majin Buu is never released. Battle of Gods, Resurrection F, and most of the Universe 6 tournament remains the same. However, the Goku Black Arc changes drastically. Zamasu uses the time ring to travel 10 years into the future where he takes Goku's body, but is killed by Ultra Ego Vegeta's timely intervention because Zamasu's theft of the time ring had long ago put the angels in constant high alert, allowing for Whis to inform Vegeta as soon as Zamasu made his move. For this part, we will first be covering the events of the Tournament of Power but with Gohan not having ultimate and Piccolo not having fused with Kami as well as no androids 17 and 18. How will events unfold from here? Well, these are questions we will answer today on Dragon Ball Super. Recall that here, no alternate timelines exist. Therefore, there is no future Zeno as well. Thus, there would be no need for a Zen exhibition match. Following the Grand Prix announcement, Goku realized that assembling a team of 10 members was his utmost priority. Initially, he struggled to come up with a list of 10 candidates. Notably, we call that Majin Buu, Android 17 and 18 were unavailable. Returning to Earth, Goku recruits Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, Roshi, and Tian Shinhan. Surprisingly, even Yamcha joins the squad this time around. Despite the notable additions to the team, two positions remain unveiled. Goku doesn't even think up the idea of recruiting Frieza, knowing that they needed two individuals, not just one. Vegeta briefly considers his brother Tabo as a potential addition to the team but quickly dismisses the notion. Recognizing Tabo's lack of strength, Vegeta concludes that relying on Golden and Trunks would be more advantageous at this point. Initially hesitant to recruit them due to their immaturity, Vegeta's perspective shifts given the circumstances. Eventually, Goku and Vegeta reluctantly agree to allow their sons to join under the condition that they will heed Gohan's leadership. While brainstorming, Piccolo also comes to the realization that it was time to undergo fusion with Kami. With the looming threat of their universe being erased, Piccolo acknowledges that the Dragon Balls would lose their significance in the face of such a catalysm. It's at this moment that Beerus springs out from his seat, a mischievous green adorning his face. Beerus is brimming with excitement as he unveils his master plan, Namekian fusion. Piccolo was the strongest Namekian by far, and if he fused with every Namekian in Universe 7, they would get the ultimate Namekian warrior. Piccolo grabs the potential of fusing with every Namekian, envisioning the creation of the ultimate Namekian warrior. However, despite this, he quickly brushes aside the notion, not intending to let his fellow Namekians suffer such a fate. However, Beerus remains resolute, brandishing a Hakai ball and questioning Piccolo's defiance against his directives. Reluctantly, Piccolo heeds Beerus' demands, begrudgingly following the two Supreme Kai's to New Namek. Upon arrival, Grand Elder Mori swiftly accedes to Piccolo's proposal, mobilizing all the warrior Namekians without hesitation. With the Dragon Balls at their disposal, the prospect of unfusing Piccolo from the warrior Namekians post Tournament of Power victory seemed entirely plausible. As the ceremonial rite commences, each warrior Namekian steps forward to place their hand upon Piccolo's shoulder, their collective energy surging in unison. Piccolo's cry echoes as every Namekian becomes assimilated within him. Initially burdened by the weight of countless souls, Piccolo feels a surge of power stabilizing within him. As the wellsprings of power stabilize, Piccolo is overcome with amazement 
and the immense surge of strength coursing within him. His power escalates exponentially, leaving him in awe of his own newfound might. With this astonishing rise in power, the strongest fighter in Universe 7 is born. However, Grand Elder Mori's plans are far from complete. Drawing upon a technique reminiscent of Grand Elder Guru's display during the Planet Namek saga, Mori unlocks Piccolo's latent potential. Though Piccolo doesn't immediately sense a significant difference, within him lies untapped reservoirs of power awaiting release, power that Piccolo himself has yet to fully comprehend. Expressing gratitude to Grand Elder Mori, Piccolo reassures him not to fret. With the Namekian race and their universe at stake, Piccolo pledges to emerge victorious in the tournament. Mori nods solemnly at Piccolo, bidding him farewell. Returning to his team, Piccolo finds them ready to set off for the tournament arena. With all preparations complete, the stage is now set for the ultimate showdown. As Team Universe 7 arrives in the World of Void, Goku observes that every universe has already gathered, noting the presence of formidable fighters among them. As the tournament kicks off, Pandominium reigns in the arena. Despite the significant alteration to Team Universe 7's composition, the early stages of the tournament would unfold much like before. Fighters who were previously eliminated by Android 17 and 18 such as Shosha, Tapu, Koket, and Kakunsa are all low-tier combatants. Consequently, they are likely to be eliminated by other competitors later in the tournament regardless of Universe 7's lineup changes. Thus, I'll only be covering the more major fights in the tournament. For example, Gohan's confrontation with Obuni from Universe 10 poses a significant challenge for Gohan. In the original story, Obuni pushed Ultimate Gohan to his limits, but in this altered timeline, Gohan is restricted to Super Saiyan 2. Despite Gohan's intensified training regimen in this what if, the absence of his ultimate form severely hampers his performance. Gohan finds himself teetering on the brink of elimination, facing the daunting prospect of bowing out of the tournament prematurely. Fortunately, Piccolo, his guardian angel, intervenes just in the nick of time, effortlessly dispatching Obuni and sparing Gohan from imminent elimination. In the absence of Frieza's interference to eliminate Frost, the latter remains a formidable presence in the arena for an extended period of time. Nevertheless, Vegeta ultimately succeeds in eliminating Frost. Meanwhile, Goku's initial encounter with Jiren unfolds similarly, prompting Piccolo to conserve his energy upon witnessing Jiren's overwhelming power, opting to confront him at a more opportune moment in the later parts of the tournament. During the clash against Saunyao and Perina, Piccolo and Gohan find themselves swapping roles, with Piccolo taking charge of the majority of the combat while Gohan charges the special beam cannon. Frieza isn't here to give Goku energy after his defeat against Jiren, so Piccolo takes up that mantle instead, having more than enough energy to help. As he reaches the tournament's halfway point, this is where I'll leave off for now. In the next part, I'll cover the rest of the Tournament of Power, the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie, and even potentially the Moro arc. Stay tuned, and I'll see you all in the next one.